Okay. So as Mahmoud said, I, my name is Aaron Nygren. I'm an extension educator uh, for Nebraska Extension. Um, so let's get into the talk here. Uh, my focus is going to be on beef manure. So um, one thing just to keep in mind and, and why we're really doing all the talks today is just remember how variable that manure can be. Um, so that's why proper sampling techniques are really important. Um, so nutrient concentrations are going to vary a lot. Um, Within an operation, they're not going to vary as much as between two operations. A lot of that's just how we feed, how we just do everyday operations. Between seasons, we're going to have differences. Um, so every year, the weather's going to be different, like we were just talking about earlier. Um, also, published book values. You know, those published book values are an average of everything. So your numbers are going to be quite different often. And then lastly is sampling techniques. So try to make sure you, you use a, a consistent sampling technique to reduce some met variability. So some things to keep in mind with sampling. Um, you may hear, you know, one of us say something and you may say that's not the way we do it. And that's always one thing to keep in mind is that sampling methods or requirements are a lot of times are determined by your state requirements. Um, so check with your local agencies, see what they require for you because it may be something slightly different than what we talk about here. Um, when we were meeting before this, you know, we, we kind of had some different um, going through our presentations, several of us had some different philosophies. So one philosophy on sampling is to sample before application. You know, the ideal thing with that, that has some advantages and disadvantages, uh, we'll go through here shortly. And then others of us were used to sampling during application. So let's go through those and see what the advantages and disadvantages are. So if we sample before application, one of the main advantages there is that those results actually help determine our application rate. Um, you know, we should, we can get those samples ahead, you know, send them into the lab, see what the, the test is, and then base our application on that. The disadvantage is it's harder to get an actual representative sample. You know, if you think about a lagoon situation or anywhere, you know, it's just hard to get a lot of samples of that actual content that we're going to put on. And then those samples may not represent the final manure nutrient content. Let's say we sample you know, we start getting some rain. Now, two months later, I can finally apply. Is that manure content the same as what I actually sampled or not? So another philosophy then is to, is to sample during loading and application. The biggest advantage of this is that you can get a very good representative sample. You know, we're mixing things during, during that process. Uh, we're gonna apply it. You know, we can pull several samples during over time. So we can get a, a pretty good, you know, representative sample we can get a very uh, good nutrient content because we know exactly that is what it was when we applied it. And in a lot of ways, it's just an easier method. Um, you know, we're not going to have, have to go out of our way to, to try to sample something. Uh, we're already in the process of doing it, so it, it does make it easier. The disadvantage of that is how do I actually use that sample to adjust my rate? I can't because it's going to take me a week or two to get that sample reback from the lab. So in this case, we have to rely on our long-term average. Um, so for some situations that works fine, um, but in some cases that, that may not be, you know, way, the way that your organization wants to do it. The other challenge is what if I'm using a long-term average and then those samples come back and the actual manure nutrient content is considerably different. Then we may have to go back and we have to add fertilizer or what if we over apply based on what was actually there. So there are some disadvantages as well. As far as how often should samples be taken, um, so this is more based of, of the way we do it in Nebraska, which is more that um, during application. So we would sample often to get some baseline values, use those for our averages. And then, you know, we would, we would keep continuous sampling, but we, if we do some changes, we're going to have to sample quite a bit more. So if we would change our feeding system, you know, if we start doing more distillers, um, if we change where or when we scrape, um, if we change how we stockpile it, and then between seasons, we're gonna to have to do some changes there as well. So keep those all in mind as you determine those baseline values. Whatever method you're doing, um, <clears throat> if we're doing solid manure, the key is take a lot of subsamples and then mix those well. The more we do, the better. Um, the key though is it still has to be something reasonable. I mean. None of us are going to take 50 subsamples and mix them together, even though that would give us really good results. So um, the key with that amount is how variable is that manure. 
Another key is whatever you do, um, try to write down that protocol because we want to be consistent in that method from year to year. If I grab it one way one year and then a totally different way the next year, those differences in that test are probably just as likely to be from the sampling method as they are from the actual manure not nutrient content itself. So as far as the number that we need to take, it all depends on how well that manure is mixed and, and how much variability there is out there. So we're gonna go through some different scenarios and you'll see that the, uh, the variability is gonna increase as we go through these. So the first one, if we're actually taking during mixing and, and, and application, um, we usually say about 10 subsamples is needed. Now, some of this is gonna depend on how you wanna do it. Do you wanna do it from just one load? You know, if you're doing from one spreader load, you'd need to get 10 samples from there. If you're doing it for a whole field, you know, just the average over that whole, 10, whole field, maybe it's just 10 of the, the loads that you apply to it. So go back again to what your state requires there. So <clears throat> in this situation, we could grab from the spreader, we could put down a tarp or a pan. You know, the tarp or the pan is probably the best way because we eliminate bias there. Um, whereas grabbing, it's sometimes easy to grab from something that you think looks like a good, a better spot or not. Next way would be if we're sampling from a pile or windrow. This is a situation where you can see that, you know, there is gonna be a little more variability there. So in this case, we would like to do 15 or more places there. Um, you know, if you have that crust layer, always discard that layer, then try to sample beneath that. Um, recommendation would be at least six inches beneath. This is when you're starting to, to need a little bit more um, involved sampling method to do it. So you might need an auger, you might need a soil probe, something to help you get to that sample. And then kind of the worst case here would be, let's just go out and take scrapings from an open lot. You know. At least 20 here, even more would probably be better because there's gonna be a lot of variability there. Um, so it's the more samples we need there to account for that variability. In this case, gotta be careful not to get a lot of dirt, you know, do whatever that you think is representative of, of the actual sample you're gonna apply. What about um, confined barns? We're starting to see more and more um, beef operations with confinement. Um, Iowa State study um, found that really location didn't make a big difference. So whether they sampled in the pack, the bedded pen apron, or the stockpile, all of those had fairly similar results. So once again, they'll probably just, you know, write down in your protocol where you're gonna sample from, try to be consistent that way. What they did find though, is that nutrient content did vary a lot by operation. So very similar to the other, any other feedlot situation. Some of the reasons for that type of housing, you know, there's different barns, different ways we're set up type of bedding, uh, the pen density, the time of year, the season, the type of feed that we're using, the housekeeping, how often do we scrape, you know, when do, how sloppy is it in there? And then finally, how are we storage, storing our manure? So very similar um, to other operations, you know, that's the key of you're gonna have to sample for yourself and try to get that figured out, that baseline. We have more operations, um, with beef that are, are using holding ponds. Um, so I'll touch just shortly on liquid manure. Um, once again, series of subsamples. So from this is where getting during pumping is, is gonna be probably the easiest way. It's gonna be a good representative sample, but we could do it before. Um, you know, we could try to pump, mix it up a little bit, try to get something that's representative as well. Whenever you go to sample liquid manure, um, you know, a little bit more challenging maybe than, than dry manure. Um, so get that sample off, take your sub sample off, uh, tape it, double bag it, you know, send it in early in the week. So similar procedures, um, just make sure you're following what, what your state requirements are. As far as what we're gonna have tested, um, once again, make sure you know what your state requires, but these are some typical things that we would test for. Um, so total nitrogen content, and then also ammonium nitrogen content. We wouldn't typically test for organic because we can just subtract the two, subtract ammonium from total and then we know what organic is. Um, then nitrate in, um, you know, usually it's very low. A lot of times we wouldn't test for that, but you can do that if you want to. Phosphorus is gonna be a big one since that's a major component of, of manure. Potassium, the moisture content, and then some of our, um, you know, lesser nutrients like zinc and, and sulfur. Soluble salts are gonna be important if you're worried about, you know, applying it to a growing crop. Um, so this is where in Nebraska, a lot of our holding ponds, they're pumping it through a center pivot. 
Um, so we need to check and make sure that EC, uh, you know, we're not putting on too high of a salt content to a growing crop. And then the last one would be pH. We do have a, a nice NEB guide from Nebraska on manure testing. Um, so that's NEB guide G1450, um, just titled Manure Testing for Nutrient Content. And then in conclusion, um, you know, my summary is just the key to have anything, just like any other testing, you got to have a good representative sample. Um, it's only as good as the time that you put into getting those samples. Um, so take, take enough time to get a good representative sample. Sample enough to have confidence in those results. You know, if you take one and it's vastly different than the next, take some more and make sure to see how those end up. And then lastly, write down your sampling protocol and, and try to use that consistently over time.